of the 100th time team. By way of celebration, we've come back here to one of the most important historical sites in the country. This is Athelney in Somerset, where King Alfred burnt the cakes and saved England from the Vikings. Last time we were here, we found loads of stuff. It was so long ago, I was the one wearing the stripy jumper. And would you believe we did it all without digging? We discovered evidence of iron working, possibly from the furnaces used to make weapons for Alfred's army in 878 AD. And Geophys stunned us all, with the first ever pictures of the abbey built to celebrate his victory. Oh, look at that. <laughs> It was frustrating, though. We weren't allowed to dig even one square inch of earth. Now, ten years later, we're back, armed with permissions, shovels and trowels. But something's never changed. We've got just three days to crack the secrets of Alfred's hideaway in the marshes. Why is this site so fantastically important? Oh, well, I think it's one of those key points in English history, really. Uh, the Danish armies, the Vikings have taken over most of the country. Uh, the only sort of kingdom left, the only leader is Alfred. And this is the place he uses as his base to fight back. So it's like one of those turning points. If he, if he hadn't have been based here, if he hadn't have been successful from here, who knows, he might have been part of a Scandinavian empire by now. <laughs> Why did he choose here? Why not somewhere else? I, th I think because of the, the local situation, we're down here in the Somerset Levels, which floods a lot. In fact, this aerial photograph, which is taken in the 40s, you can see Athen is this H-shaped island here, but all around it is floodable land. Well, all this in this picture is water, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it was flooded in the 1940s, and it would have been flooded in the Anglo-Saxon period. So it's actually naturally defended by marshes and floodland and reeds and so on. It's a very low-lying site. So you could literally hide an army here. Ten and years ago when we were here, it was listed, it was protected. Scheduled ancient monument, yeah. Is that yeah. still the case? Uh, yes, yes. In fact, the area has been extended in, in, within that last ten years. Then how come we're now allowed to dig it? Well, because I think there's been a change of attitude in, in archaeology. Ten years ago, it was very much, you know, digging's destruction, therefore we don't do it under any circumstances if we can avoid it. Now, in order to manage it properly, we, we think we need a certain amount of small-scale excavation to understand it. And indeed, we won't be able to look after it without understanding more about it. Tim, a long time. <laughs> We've been waiting ten years to find out what's under the ground here, but how long has farmer Tim Morgan been waiting? Rather longer than that, yes, I've often wondered. Because you were born here, weren't you, Tim? Indeed, so was, you've been wondering yeah. about it all your life? Always, yes. <laughs> In 1993, the geophys results from the abbey end of the site turned out to be one of the highlights of the three days. Now, you well, do remember at breakfast this morning, the last comment was, geophysics will be the answer to it all. Yes. Yeah. Right, well, you're now going to see a plot that will astound you. This is if the technology works. <laughs> so, all the walls are aligned oh, these way. Truth, look at that! <laughs> it's pretty amazing. That's, that's the monastic church, is it, at the top? It was the first geophys plot of this kind ever seen on Time Team, and it still ranks as one of the best. Well, you can see we're getting... Church, aisles. That's fantastic. <laughs> this has never been excavated. There's no pictures, there's no prints, there's no drawings. So this is no. actually the first time anybody's ever the, seen... Anybody's ever seen it. ...the layout of, of the church of Athelney the Abbey. Ten years later, and both beards and printing times have shortened. Well, what we've done is we've actually used our new software and given it a bit of colour, mm. and it's yeah. enhanced it. Yeah. And we're not going to get any better than that with resistance. Uh, no. Uh, I mean, there's the monument uh, and all the wall lines. Yeah. But what we're going to do now is radar. Right. We've got a superb plan 
What the radar can give us in addition is actually depth information. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Enjoy our rich library of documentaries covering key events and locations of the medieval period. History Hit's medieval offering features leading historians such as Dan Jones, Eleanor Yanega and Kat Jarman. Not only that, but we've a rich library of audio documentaries covering every period of history through our network of podcasts. Sign up now for a free trial and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. Athelney Abbey, founded by King Alfred in 893 AD, would have been altered a lot over the years. Presumably, much of what he's showing here relates to how it looked at the time of the dissolution in 1539 AD. This was Mick's idea of how it looked based on the geophys, and our brief now from English Heritage is to test this interpretation, see how much survives and what condition it's in. We're also going to investigate one bit on the geophys that ten years ago we thought might relate to Alfred's original church. It's very clear major alignment along here, but in fact it's, it's out, of, out of alignment with, with this little area over here. It's the big question. Could this be the remnants of Alfred's early church? Geophys have marked out two trenches. So we can start the trenches? You can start the trenches. I think that is the first time in 100 programmes that he's generously said, yeah, you go ahead and start the <laughs> Take him at his word. We Let's will. We will. Let's get cracking. Before our last visit, all anyone knew was that this monument, put up in 1801, was said to roughly mark the location of Alfred's Abbey. Our geophys plot changed all that, and now we're all extremely proud that we've been given the chance to excavate such an important historic site. This will be the first full-scale archaeological investigation allowed here. Even better, we've also been given permission to dig the other end of the island, traditionally thought to have been the location of Alfred's fort, and where ten years ago we found evidence of ancient metalworking. Last time we came here, Phil Harding was in charge of our field walking operation and discussed the star find with Tim Morgan's dad. We found some quite, uh, or something in particular, which is very interesting. Um, this object here. Yes, well, we don't see that sort of thing every day, you know. Well, we think it's a piece of metal slag. The people who did their geophysical survey up here did actually detect strong indications of, of metal work. Oh. actually in the oh, ground yeah. Yeah. and um, this bit we've actually found on the surface obviously been dragged up by the plough very interesting unique i should say the find was important enough for an expert to drive 300 miles to see it iron smelting slags come in a, a variety of shapes and sizes oh. and they can be characteristic of certain periods and when chris described the slag to me it immediately brought parallels in my mind to say either it's Iron Age, or possibly Iron Age, or possibly Anglo-Saxon. Um, so by looking at it now in the hand, I'm much more happy that it's probably of Anglo-Saxon day. One, two, Fantastic, two. you've started two. digging. Yeah, we have, yeah. Jerry's back with us, and he's circled several targets on the geophys plot that might relate to Anglo-Saxon metalworking. We've opened up trenches over these two signals. Where is it in the ground? Well, it's quite difficult to see, isn't it? Yeah. But go on, Jerry. Show, show. If we put it on to the, uh, the sort of the background natural, yeah. we're getting readings about thirty or forty. Over here, nearly thirteen hundred. It's really, really magnetic. That is. I think what's happening is it's going to swing around here. You can see over here, it's really dark again. Do you know what the value is there? Oh, oh, it's, it's actually gone negative. Negative. Yeah. So that, that's typical of a huge lump of metal. metal. What was going on here? So we can see that Jerry sliced through the lump of slag we found last time. And in this cross section, we can see that there's some gas bubbles at the top and at the bottom, but the rest is very, very smooth. It's been fully liquid, fully molten. The presence of these white iron oxide crystals in our lump of slag means that it isn't the waste product of iron smelting, but possibly a byproduct of making steel. Now, what exactly is steel compared to ordinary iron? Right. The, the iron that's in the bulk of artefacts is just pure iron. Today, we'd call it wrought iron. But steel has got carbon in it, and it makes a very good cutting edge. It keeps the cutting edge, and it's very, very sharp. The Saxons were masters of steel making, probably unparalleled until the 18th century. 
Well, that's odd, isn't it? Because you th tend to think of steel as an industrial revolution yeah. material, not a Saxon material. No, but the Saxons have a very, very finely developed art. It's extremely technologically demanding and extremely expensive. So the people, the status that we're looking at is high status, the top. So what you're saying is that if we can prove that this is the result of steel making, then it's more likely to be to do with Alfred than anyone else. Absolutely, yeah. We have to hope that one of our two trenches here at the fort end will turn up dating evidence to prove the soil stains and slag waste are Saxon. Jerry also wants more iron slag, and ideally bits of waste metal to help him prove steel was being worked here. Well, that's slag, that's definitely iron slag, the sort of thing we should be looking for. <laughs> OK, Paul, let's dig for some more of it. At the abbey end of the site, we're opening up a third trench. This will be a really long one to examine the remains across the width of the monastery. But the first signs aren't good. With this mortar spread, it just shows how shallow it all is. Well, yes, it's obviously been so ploughed to death, hasn't it? It's, really? it's got onto the top of where the plough's yeah. just cracking it on the top surface. OK, then, Gary. Yeah. Carry right. on. Further down the hill in Trench 2, we're looking for evidence of a wall that could be part of Alfred's original Saxon monastery. All right then, Dave. Oh, hi. Where's this wall then? <laughs> well, it, it's supposed to be about here, I think. Well, I know where it's supposed to be, but this is a, a trench distinguished by a lack of wall, it's, isn't it? It's early days yet, but what we're finding in this trench are bits of human bone. At the moment, Mick thinks this may be the result of burials being washed downhill or perhaps disturbed by ploughing. At the fort end in Trench 2, Phil's digging this geophys signal. And we've had to go down through all this uh, plough soil to get down onto the edge of what looks like a ditch running off in this direction here. The ditch has produced more metal slag for Jerry to examine. What are you doing? Just checking it with a magnet, see if there's metal in it. Oh, there's a magnet in here? Yes, yeah. It just yeah. keeps the magnet clean so I don't get contaminated with yeah. the... And is there... No. It's similar to the, that, the big lump that was found ten years ago. But that's definitely slag? Oh, absolutely. No doubt at all. No doubt at all. What's worrying me is that Phil's also finding what looks like Iron Age pottery that would date to something like a thousand years before Alfred. Have we made a mistake? Could all the metal waste be Iron Age? It could, but I'd like to see... I mean, as I said, this, this slag seemed a little bit different to, to the other material. Now, there's no reason why we couldn't have continuous occupation and so that what we're seeing is actually two phases of activity. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go off and until we can actually work out the archaeological relationship of these to be able to say it's all Iron Age or it's all Saxon. If I'm honest, I don't want to hear about the Iron Age. I want to find evidence of the man I heard so much about last time we were here, King Alfred the Great. At one point in the time that we're discussing this weekend, in, in 878, uh, Alfred's kingdom had shrunk to the few acres that surround Athelney. The particular uh, reason why we know so much about Alfred is uh, from the fact that a chap called Asser, who was uh, a Welsh friend of his and became one of his bishops, wrote a very detailed life about him. It's the only life of a Saxon king that we have of that kind. But he had a, a horrendous situation to face because the Danes had literally split England in two. They'd uh, cruelly slaughtered most of the kings of places like Northumbria and East Anglia. Uh, and were obviously intent on taking the rest of England for themselves. Were the weapons for Alfred's fight back being made on this hill? At the fort site, we've just turned up our first bit of metal. Any idea what it might be, Kai? Yeah, it looks very much like a knife. At this end, you've got the tang. What's that? The bit that went into the handle. And on one of these sides is going to be the back and one of them is going to be the blade, the cutting edge. I've got my fingers crossed, but it could still turn out to be medieval. How long will it take before you can tell us? Well, we're going to excavate it a bit longer. A few minutes. Yeah. Yeah? And, yeah, come back to us. Yeah. What are you doing out here? You're normally beavering away indoors. I'm allowed to be curious, just like <laughs> anybody else. Robbins brought me a map that includes a drawing of Guthrum, leader of the Vikings. But really, it's just an excuse for a historian to do a bit more storytelling. So the Vikings are sweeping down this way? Yes, and also landing on the coast of, of, of Devon, so that effectively Alfred is cut off. He's isolated, and yet he feels safe. 
before he sallies forth round about Easter of 878 to uh, finally defeat Guthrum at Eddington. And that's the turning point. That's the moment at which Alfred is, is coming back to establish his Wessex and eventually, in the hands of his son and grandsons, England itself. Have you worked out what it is? Yeah. Yeah. It looks like a kinky fish knife, but it is, in fact, an Anglo-Saxon scrammer sax, just a small, curved-backed knife. It is actually Saxon. It is so Saxon. Does that mean that we can date some of this slag working to the Saxon period? Yeah. Quite definitely. possibly, yeah. 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 yeah, it looks like it's in association with the slag, so it's really exciting. And could it be associated with Alfred? Conceivably, yeah. I don't see why not. Astonishingly, even the horn handle has survived. Oh, look at that. What's Lovely. At the Abbey end, the news isn't so good. What we've discovered in Trench 1 is that all the building stone has been thoroughly robbed away to be used in other buildings. But there are still some great finds among the rubble. It's the three lions. It's the arms of the king. It's England. You can just see the bottom edge of the lion there. Oh, so right. the shield yes. would have come up and then the two other lions above it. So. so one of the abbey floors would have looked like this around 1290, but we've got tiles from three different floors here. How often would they have been renewed? It was probably a constant thing. It's like mending the fourth bridge. Um, <laughs> you know, you're, you're laying new tiles um, in different parts of the church as different things are happening. And one of the things that the stone is suggesting is that you've got fairly constant building going on. I feel really quite concerned by the amount of bone that's coming out of this. Yeah. In our trench furthest down the hill, Trench 2, our jumble of human bone and rubble has become even more puzzling. There's bits everywhere. Yeah. There's bits of skull, yeah. bits yeah. of long bone, there's more in the trays. Yeah. And then there's this blooming thing, which... Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you, Dave, have you decided what, whether it's actually a, a complete body now, or...? Um, I think it looks like it is complete, but whether it's sort of in situ, I'm still not sure. It almost looks like it's sort of... Uh, almost pushed together and reburied or something mm. like that I mean, it because looks, it's such yeah. a jumble in here. I was going to say, it doesn't <coughs> look like a proper articulated skeleton to no, me. It looks it like a bundle of bones in a bag, basically. And somewhere in there should be the wall geophys detected. Sorting this out is clearly going to be a challenge tomorrow. But for me, the exciting story today has been at the other end of the island, where we're digging up a site that in Alfred's time could have looked like this. What Victor's showing us is the iron working process, the intense activity. But what we've been excavating today is what's gone into the ditch. Debris that's been swept out from the smithy to fill the ditch. And what we want to do tomorrow is to go and look for the rest of this activity. So what are the things here might we actually still be able to find? It's the things like the post holes, the, the, the hole for the post for the, for the anvil, and the debris that will be scattered around. So you're confident place. we might get something tomorrow? I'm confident. The geophysics showed us the iron working today, not just the knife, and there's more to come from that for tomorrow. The metal survived really well, hasn't yeah, it? Has. Who'd have thought it? End of day one, and already we've proved this area of metal working is Saxon. The question is, can we prove a link with King Alfred in the ninth century? Could we be excavating Alfred the Great's weapon factory? Join us after the break. Welcome back. And out there, it's going to be a really hot and a really critical day too. When I first got here, I knew that this end of the site was going to be really important to our understanding of the island of Athelney in Saxon times, because here, King Alfred's Abbey is located. But now, over here, where we'd already discovered evidence of iron working, we've found this lovely little knife, which puts the far end of the site well and truly into the Saxon period too. Could we be lucky enough in our hundredth programme to have found evidence of Saxon metalworking connected with King Alfred's army? Today, our expert in ancient technology, Jerry MacDonald, wants to investigate the magnetic signals he's found here, just a short distance away from the trench where we found the knife. It was on top of what we think is a ditch filled with metal slag from a forge. We're actually excavating this large anomaly here but it extends further in that direction. Right. So I think if we extend about two metres, that would encompass the whole thing, and then we can take that off and we'll actually see the relationship of this black to the other material that's in here and actually get a good edge to it on that side. OK. And we can potentially look at these alternative strong anomalies as possible smithies. Last time we were here, Victor conjured up a picture of Athelney in Alfred's time, an island surrounded by swamp, with only a causeway linking it to the Saxon settlement at East Ling. 
Ten years on, and Surveyor Henry has created a more scientific view of this landscape. The, the, the blue areas show those areas which have been flooded seasonally, so this is taken from the geology map. As you'll be aware, really, I suppose, farming. That's right, yeah. yes. Um, but what, what this shows in terms of uh, Alpha's time is although Athens is an island on three sides, it's actually got relatively dry access from Ling along the peninsula. And the green areas coming up here show that those areas which are low enough to have been wet enough to have the sorts of vegetation you get, so the yeah. sort of scrubby, reedy sort of landscape, which effectively cuts off Athenley as, as an island. Yeah. From, from the dryland access, you won't be able to see it. Henry even thinks that the swamp would have been too thick to easily get a boat through, which is more or less what I thought 10 years ago. This is what it must have been like for Alfred. I can't even move, let alone run away from any Vikings. The only way in would have been across the causeway, and Stuart's been studying aerial photos looking for traces of Alfred's defences at that end of the island, fortifications that are mentioned in the documents. According to Asser, who was Alfred's friend and biographer, he wrote about Athelney, which is surrounded by swampy, impassable and extensive marshland and groundwater on every side. It cannot be reached in any way except by punts or by a causeway which has been built by protracted labour between two fortresses. And then he goes on, a formidable fortress of elegant workmanship was set up by the command of the king at the western end of the causeway. Yeah. And this is sort of swampy, reedy stuff. Uh, yeah, very oh, yeah. much so. Yeah. Yeah. Victor's going to draw the defences and Stuart's going to be looking for any evidence of them at the causeway end of the island. And he won't be getting any help from Phil because he's been moved from the fort end over to the abbey site where we've got a complicated jumble of human bones mixed up with the ruins of Alfred's Abbey. We've got a real problem here in, in trying to understand whether, you know, these are burials intact, whether there's derived bits of skull or whatever. But we needed Phil to sort out what, quite where, how this wall fitted into it that's on the geophysics. Well, I think I've shorted it, actually. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go back over there yeah, now? <laughs> yeah. But you've got a burial in it. Yeah, no, but the point is, John told me this morning the wall's going to be about here. Yeah. And look, we've got a perfectly good front oh, edge. That, that almost looks like a mortared edge. That's right, it? that's right. I've actually got the back edge. I'm, I'm still working that way. Yeah. But more importantly, like you say, look, I've got this pelvis in there with two vertebrae there and what looks like probably the part of a forearm so it looks like they're buried yeah. like that the point is that we've got an articulated skeleton here and the most important thing about it is that it's articulated and it's on top of the wall the wall must have been knocked down when that body was put in yeah. so what does that tell us about what might have been going on here well, I, th I think it's, it's actually very important because it means that this building, which you can see on the geophysics, and this is the one that's at a skewed angle. Our mystery the, one that's yeah, early. Um, it's actually gone out of use and been demolished, presumably down to ground level, before these burials have been put in. What we've got to tell is when the bodies were put in and yeah. when that building was knocked down. Yeah. So this is the medieval church, and this is the Saxon church that William of Malmesbury described in the 12th century. Yeah. Could our building be the Saxon church? I don't think so, because this has got circular apses around all the sides, whereas this, as far as we can see on the geophysics and what we see in the ground, is straight. I think that building is probably up on the top of the hill beyond the monument. So we haven't got the Saxon church here? Yeah, this could be, because there could be another one or another building. They often had more than one church on the same, on the same site. It's, it's probably more likely that it is if it's been got rid of in a new uh, rebuilding phase. I like that. Stay here for a bit. Don't get that <laughs> okay, right. See you later. Meanwhile, at Phil's old trench at the other end of the island, Stuart's got some news he's desperate to tell me about. For 10 years, I've been running across sites looking for you so that you could interpret them for me. <laughs> well, it's kept you slim anyway, Tony, all that running. Now, this big ditch coming through here. Stuart's interested in this red bank and the makeup of the ditch we're digging here. He thinks this trench put in in search of some more metal waste has unearthed something much more interesting. Don't, don't get confused by all this lo lovely data. He's been reading a report about some boreholes put in during work on the flood defences last year, which resulted in the discovery of a ditch identical to the one we're digging. We're standing just about here, and one of the boreholes in particular, which was taken there, 
showed evidence of a, a red clay bank which sealed a deposit which was 7th century in date, wow. because it was radiocarbon dated, yeah. but was cut by a ditch which was late 8th century in date. So we know that there is a ditch and bank there in the sort of early Saxon period around there. So I think what we're looking at potentially is this here being part of a, a fortification around this end of the, the island here with the causeway leading off to East Ling. If you look over on the other side, there's East Ling there. There's our site with the causeway in between. So we're looking at something which is fortified across the end here simply to stop invaders actually getting on the island. When you say fortification, would it have had stakes? It would be built of a, a big ditch with a wood, a wooden um, a palisade on top of it. Victor's already started working on the drawing, be worth having a, a look at. What's you got, mate? That's it, yeah, it's looking good, Victor. It's a double palisade with a walkway in between. Stuart believes the ditch we're digging was part of Alfred's defences, and what's more, the latest geophys plot may be showing the ditch running around this end of the island. And I, I just think there's this general sort of hint of settlement, or, or I don't know if it's a ditch, I don't know if it's defence. The geophysics has given us some nice, interesting hints, but it isn't necessarily giving us the full story. But there's one intriguing feature showing on the geophys that surely we've got to dig. And basically, there may be some sort of break in the in the in the possible ditch. Oh, I not think. an entrance! I don't Straight know. Entrance. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's an entrance. I don't. I've got no idea. It's but... a ritual entrance, and we'll find a small Saxon sacrificial brooch in the side of it to date. Tony, you've been we hanging can... around archaeologists too long. <laughs> I think I am getting a bit carried away, but wouldn't it be fantastic if this new trench did find evidence connected with the story of King Alfred? And from what I remember about Guthrum, leader of the Vikings, I'd expect the ditch to be extremely deep to keep him out. They practised what was known as the Blood Eagle, which was a peculiarly nasty form of death in which they, they kind of slit the victim down the front while living, peeled back the ribs and then flung back on either side the lungs to form a living blood eagle. <laughs> it's so disgusting. It is absolutely revolting. You, you are talking about rather brutal, ruthless men. For our return to Athelney, we've decided to bring Alfred and Guthrum to life. As two men of high status, they'd have been dressed roughly the same. Alfred himself was very keen that his armies were quite professional. Um, and as such, that meant that he stated they must have a helmet, they must have a shield, for example, of a very particular size, a sword such as this thing. This is also an opportunity to see what weapons edged with steel actually looked like. Now, this would have been tool steel. This is what all the cutting's done with. I'm not sure a pregnant Carenza should be wielding a Viking axe, but certainly handling real weapons helps us imagine Alfred's predicament. There are only two other Saxon metalworking sites discovered in Britain, and the connection with King Alfred here makes the evidence we're digging up at the fort end all the more important. Jerry's interested in collecting even the tiniest bits of evidence. So these are bits that have come from this process here. That's right. We call it hammer scale. They're flakes of metal, flakes of rust that has come off, and we know that's very characteristic of blacksmithing. Not a vast amount, I'll just pop it in there. Right, and then all we're doing is just... Using more 9th century technology, we're trying to cook some cakes like the ones Alfred famously burnt. To pick up some of that grain. But first we've got to make them, and Carenza's grinding the flour. This is the 100th programme. I've been told I've got to get my hands dirty, so this seems as good a way as any. These would have been uh, griddle cakes, so they would have been milky and eggy and uh, very, like, sort of like crumpets. Milk, egg, butter, honey, salt and, of course, Carenza's flour are all you need to make authentic Saxon griddle cakes. Maybe you should have a look at some of the trenches while you're waiting. At the Abbey site, Phil spent the day untangling the skeleton that was mixed up with the rubble in Trench 2 and now has a tale to tell. Somebody's actually placed the body of a juvenile in there. After the collapse That's of the wall. after it, because it's sitting on top of the rubble of the demolition of the right. building. But at a later stage, uh, again, somebody has dug away this hole that I'm standing in, probably to get the stone, demolition stone, sure. all these bits. And in so doing, they've chopped through the skull of that child. Uh -huh. 
that's, that's extremely interesting because I've come across uh, a major demolition work carried out in 1674 by the labourers of Captain John Hucker, who owned this site yeah. at that time. And there's a letter in the Bodleian Library describing it. And he says, uh, there they continued digging up the ruins and foundations of that sometimes famous and ancient monastery. They took up the bases of the pillars of the church lately and nearby found some graves, one among the rest near eight feet long, as the workman guessed, with the bones answerable. They found graves in 1674. That's right. And then they go on to talk about further work that they did south of the east part of the church, which has to be over in that direction. So that would fit with that, wouldn't it? It's just fascinating to actually get some <laughs> historical detail that ties in with the archaeology. That's Good great. stuff. Thanks a lot. Not at all. Glad I could be of service. At the fort site, we've been waiting for a pottery specialist to look at the finds that crucially might help to date this ditch. And now the moment of truth has arrived. I must admit, my eye goes to that. Right. Because is that medieval? That's more recent than that, isn't it? No, no, no. Well, it's handmade, isn't it? It's got this, these nice incised lines around it. I, mean, I, would have, I would have thought that was late Saxon. Really? Frankly, really? yeah. Um, the problem is you'll realise that we haven't got much late Saxon pot from round well, here. Well, I know. I've been saying that for the last couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> it's rare to find Saxon pottery in Somerset. There simply isn't any from Alfred's time in the 9th century. And it's assumed they were using wooden or leather vessels, and those don't survive. No, this is later than Alfred. The latest it could poss possibly, possibly be would be, what, 12th century? But I, I would put it somewhere around about 10th, I would think. Right. It means the ditch was here a hundred years after Alfred, but could it have been here a long time before him? We think the pottery from the lower part of the ditch might be Iron Age. Hang on, you wanted this a big bit. I think it could be well, well be um, late Saxon Iron Age. I mean, on balance, I have to say, I think it was probably Iron Age rather than late Saxon. And is it the fabric make you think that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, could we be looking at something then that's, uh, that's an Iron Age ditch that's you know, Alfred picks it because it's, it's already there, he can see it, he can revamp it. Have yeah. you got anything else that would help with I mean, presumably a ditch like this is going to run round this hillside, Well, we think it? we can see about half the circuit, yeah. Oh, right, yeah. But on, on the geophysics. Yeah. So, we're getting a new prehistoric site out of this, aren't we? Yeah, we are. <laughs> Exciting <laughs> it's rather, rather good, yeah. Age. Yeah. So it looks like Alfred was reusing Iron Age defences. That's brilliant. We didn't know that before. What everyone does know is that Alfred burnt the cakes because he was worrying about the Vikings. <laughs> yep. My excuse? Well, it's got to be that my mind's already racing ahead to tomorrow. <laughs> Ideally, we need a big lump of waste metal for Jerry to analyse. We've got the entrance through the defences to excavate. And wouldn't it be great if Phil could find a bit of Alfred's early monastery? So do you think Alfred's been a bit hard done by then, allowing them to burn? I do now. I didn't before. <laughs> I thought he was an idiot, but I now realise how difficult it is. Phil, how do you feel about being back here after ten years? Absolutely incredible, Tony. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when you consider that this is the only site in 100 programmes we've never actually put a hole in before now, it's unbelievable. And well, to do it... When we've actually got such a historical relationship with Alfred, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I've no. got something for you by way of celebration. <laughs> what? <laughs> Burnt cakes. <laughs> really nice. <laughs> Who but Time Team would celebrate their hundredth programme with a half a mug of warm white wine? And that. Join us after the break. It's actually not too bad, is it? Welcome back, beginning of day three on the Isle of Athelney. I'm driving across to the far end of the site where people think King Alfred the Great was once holed up when he was fighting his guerrilla campaign against the Vikings 1,300 years ago. Now, we've already got evidence of Anglo-Saxon metalworking over here and we've got the beginnings of a big defensive ditch. But could they really have anything to do with King Alfred the Great? We've got just one day left. Mick. Morning, Tone. Yesterday, Stuart was saying that he thought that the ditch along here could be part of some kind of Anglo-Saxon defence. Yeah, I think that's likely. If you come back here and look at the profile, you can see the hill here, look, he's dropping down. 
The ditch we've discovered here runs off at an angle like this, and today we're hoping to find more evidence of it in this trench, where Geofiz think we might find the entrance. What we're hoping to prove is that this was an Iron Age ditch that Alfred the Great reused in the 9th century. So he could have been using something that was already over a thousand years old. Yeah, and why not? You know, if you're looking for somewhere to defend and you've already got a defence on an island, put a new fence up, you know, refurbish it and you're away. Ian's task today is to reach the bottom to prove it was first dug in the Iron Age. Alfred's defences would have been designed to prevent access onto the island along the causeway from East Ling. The causeway, still in use today, really stands out now that it's been reinforced with white concrete. So Alfred himself would probably have ridden across that causeway on exactly the same line yeah. as that white line yeah. that we see today. Picking his way through the, the bog on each side, across the bridge, seeing that big defensive bank in front, up through the doorway, all that industrial activity on top with furnaces going and spits working away, uh, you know, as you come up that slope through there. But the surprise is that anybody's bothered to do this in the Iron Age. Can I just interrupt you a minute? Ten years ago, Carenza believed she discovered evidence of Alfred's fort. This is the fort area that we're looking at. Mm. Can you actually see those, those sort of black lines coming around here? Are they intermittent messed around? Yeah, they're coming yeah, right around there. Yeah. You can also almost see a circular structure going right round there. That could be the site of the fort. Mick wasn't convinced. It's exciting. We've actually found <laughs> well, that's, that's, something that's, yeah. that could be the right... Yeah. It's roughly the right shape, it's roughly the right size, or it's, well, that's it's the, the shape thing. and the size it's that the, aren't It's the shape of it that also worries me. I mean, I, I, I mean, here's Alfred, presumably with his back to the wall. He's coming in, you know, retreating to this. I, I, do, I feel sceptical about it. You're not cynic, Mick. It does Eventually, suggest... after transcribing the soil pattern showing on the aerial photo, a different conclusion was reached. It does come up in other ways it, as well. It does look remarkably prehistoric. It does, it does. It's like some sort of Iron Age farm. It does, yeah, it does. Or, uh, yeah. Now, ten years on, it looks like we're proving Athelney was occupied in the Iron Age. That's at least 700 years before the earliest documentary evidence, which tells us about a hermit, St Ethelwyn, who lived on the island in the 7th century. Now, this St. Ethelwyn was the son and the brother of kings of the West Saxons in the late 7th century, 670s, 80s, 90s. That is the exact time at which the Saxons first conquered this part of Somerset. And from that point, you get the feeling that this is a, a special place, a royal place, because certainly at Alfred's time, it was known as the island of the Athelings, or the princes. Uh, and there's no reason to suppose that this isn't the kind of area that Alfred, as a king of the West Saxons, wouldn't have visited regularly, possibly as a child, possibly as a hunting area, and uh, so that it would occur to him naturally as a place that he knew to seek refuge in when he came here in 878. This would have been the perfect place to be a hermit, wouldn't it? You'd have been surrounded on all sides by the marsh, so you'd have been protected from the people, close to God. The quiet, contemplative life, yeah. And in fact, that's exactly what Victor's drawing here. It could be because this had been a religious site that Alfred founded a monastery at Athelney in the 9th century. And Phil's still hoping to find some dating evidence that might prove we've located a bit of that early church. He's opening up one last trench at the Abbey End. So we've got the what we think is the early building here on this alignment, yep. and up here the main body of the church on a slightly skewed alignment. And where we've got the trench is where this building and the main abbey intersect, in right. other words, there. Try and take this Eastern Lady Chapel, the square right. extension, and put it over there. We're also trying to make sense of the medieval monastery, and the excavated plan of Muchelnley Abbey, 15 miles away, is being compared against our Geophys plot. Both monasteries were of a similar size and history. And the interesting thing, one of, one of the interesting things here is that the farmhouse itself is actually orientated exactly along the line of the, the abbey. The abbey, of course, isn't on the same orientation as the hill, so it's as if the farmhouse is respecting the abbey rather than respecting the hill itself, oh, yeah. as if the farmhouse or its foundations have been put in at a time when the abbey is still standing. We'd established the extent of the medieval monastery, but now we're beginning to appreciate the details within it. The cloister, for instance, is in exactly the same position. 
With visiting experts looking at all the finds, we're learning about the history of Alfred's monastery across the centuries. The monks here at Athelney would have walked across a floor like this around 1500 AD. With a whole mass of these yeah. similar pattern designs and altogether. And half tiles along the edge. You'll see these slightly darker colour tiles. Mm. They're overcooked, so over they're fire. quite different compared to that. Yes, that's they? a good one. So you see that's overcooked. Turn it inside, it's gone almost black. And there are lots of those. I think that the Athelney monks were buying a whole lot of seconds doing it on the cheap. Ten years ago, I'd never have guessed that we'd be back here with the chance to dig such an important site, and it's the Saxon evidence we're finding at the fort end that's got me going, especially now it looks like we've just made another cracking find. Cedric, I hear you've got some metal work. Yeah. Can I come I down there? Certainly. Oh, crikey, yeah. <laughs> Presumably yeah. it's not a sword or anything like that, is it? I wouldn't have thought so, not with yeah. a, a hook Oh, yes, it's end. got this end on it. I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like the sort of thing where you fit this end into a wooden handle and it's like a scythe. Yep. I mean, it would have to be broken, wouldn't it? Because normally they're quite a length. That's right. What's it actually in? Um, well, all this black stuff is appears to be metalworking debris, perhaps smithing debris or something like that. So it could be a, a bit of scrap or something that's broken or something that's going to be reworked, I suppose, couldn't it? Definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, if that's a Saxon scythe, I mean, how many of those are there? Well, that's right, very it's few. Be, it's going to be quite rare, isn't it? It is. We'll need to bring in a specialist conservator to excavate it. Unfortunately, the Saxon knife we discovered on day one was badly worn and can only be loosely dated between the 6th and 12th century. Now, this is my personal knife. It's my everyday knife I use for eating, uh, doing small carving jobs and things. Now, if I just orientate this the correct way, you can see that you've got this classic sort of humpbacked sea axe blade shape. And that's the shape it, of the blade's very similar, it? Is. It? I mean, obviously, this has got a, uh, an antler handle on it, a carved antler handle. Uh, whereas this one might have had this bone one. Finding Saxon evidence at the abbey end of the site has been made all the more difficult by the discovery of a medieval graveyard put on top of earlier archaeology. Nevertheless, the dig in this area has produced some special finds. One possibility with things like this is it could be for marking out on documents, you know, because any document has got lines to set out where the text's going. So on parchment or vellum? And, what, and, and lead would mark well. It would, yeah. On either a point or perhaps a, 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 a so, wider line. So are you saying these, this, this item is, is an item of grave goods that is gone with, with, with a, a monk to, to his grave? Well, it, it might have done, but what is much more important for it I think is probably that it's shown us literacy, mm. uh, a scriptorium, scriptorium manuscript yeah. compilation, that sort of thing. So that's a cracking find. It's a great find. And it's not just our finds that'll go on the record. Presumably, being that size, you're either grinding up pigments, are you, or medicines or something like that? Pigments or medicines. And All the fragments Tim and his family have discovered over the years have been under scrutiny. Mick's favourite being this chunk of monastic bell. And if I can lift it, because it's blooming heavy, made of bronze, <laughs> you can see the sound bow, that it's the bottom end of the bell. Mm -hmm. Graphics have gone to town reconstructing it. But it's unbelievable in a way that so little is left of this famous monastery, which we know once extended across this hill and looked something like this at the time of the dissolution in 1539, when the bell of Athelney Abbey would have rung out across the marshes for the last time. As for finding evidence of the early Saxon church, the complex of robbed out walls proved in the end too difficult to interpret, despite the encouragement of finding some early pottery. And this is possibly what we call Saxon Norman type stuff, maybe um, 11th century. 11th, Good Lord. that sort of date, so, so late Saxon, it's all that transition. So this is the That's first good. link that we've got at this end of the yeah, hill yeah, yeah. with yeah. Alfred's monastery, This is Alf Alfred's abbey. Somebody who was in that abbey in the 11th century was here and they dropped this pot. What we've done is we've taken an area from the resistance plot. It's no wonder Phil had a difficult time. The Geophys radar survey shows the remains don't survive to any great depth. These are 10 metre slices through the ground. And so we're at this ground surface here. So nothing showing at the ground surface. We move along 
and here at about 40 centimetres we're just starting to see wall lines and as we go deeper here they are showing quite clearly and then as we continue to look into the ground we're disappearing below the actual foundation level. It's almost a real technological leap forward in the 10 years since we were here last, isn't it? You won't need to dig in a few years' time. So it's not surprising we didn't find evidence of Alfred's original Saxon church that looked something like this, according to William of Malmesbury, who visited Athelney in the 12th century. But the thrill for me is that we found so much Saxon archaeology at the fort end of the island, in Alfred the Great's guerrilla base in the marshes. As Jerry predicted, we think we found evidence of a Saxon workshop. This bit of stone would have supported one of the posts. And the conservator agrees with us. This could be part of a Saxon scythe. So do you think you're going to be able to get it back to looking something, well, reasonably like a sickle blade rather than just a lump of metal? Yes, I think so, I think so. It, we won't take it back to bare metal because a lot of it has corroded away but you will get um, a, good, a good idea of the original shape. It's a fantastically exciting find, isn't it? I mean, there's virtually none of these known at all from the anglo saxon I've period. Of a, I've never heard of a parallel, no. Yeah, there's a nice, strong edge still there. And that's the cutting edge, that yep. side. Yes. Would have been in use this way. Oh. The snaith would have come somehow off of here, not quite sure, because there are no parallels to this. And that would have been the cutting edge that and went through the And this would have been the cutting edge that went like that. After examination in the lab, Jerry's opinion was that this was either a scythe or a draw knife used for woodworking. Tests showed that it may have had a carbon steel cutting edge. Although we haven't as yet been able to prove the metalworking dates to Alfred the Great in the 9th century, our experts still think it most likely. Sadly, this trench didn't find evidence of the entrance into Alfred's defences. That must be elsewhere. But look at this. What we have found is stunning evidence of the defensive ditch continuing around the island. It's much deeper here, but crucially, it contains the same pottery sequence. 10th century Saxon fragments in the top of the ditch and Iron Age pottery in the bottom. That's pretty well the same sequence as over there. Ditch dug in the Iron Age, presumably some sort of Iron Age fort or something here, certain amount of silting, yep. Alfred comes in, no pottery in Alfred's time, and then lots of stuff dumped in, which gets the late Saxon pottery in both in this trench and the other one. It's gone out of use by then. So the sequence is very clear. And we know that it's an Iron Age site open with the defences in, in Alfred's time as a result of that. I'm That's sure fantastic. I advanced this as a theory 10 years ago. <laughs> she did. She did. You've got to give it to Not her. with this ditch. <laughs> You're only 20 yards out. I don't think that's too bad over 10 I think, years. I think 20 <laughs> yards and 10 years is too much. <laughs> oh, crikey, look at that. That's a colourful trench, that is, Ian. In Ian's trench, where we originally discovered the ditch, the surprise is that it's much shallower than expected. This green clay, that's the base of the ditch there. I mean, one possibility at the moment, I think, is that this is a big quarry ditch. They're yeah. digging, digging this ditch out to get material to stack up to on make a rampart big rampart there. up here, yeah. yeah. The ditch on this side of the hill wouldn't have needed to be deep because it was protected by impassable marsh but it would be much deeper here, where the fortifications would have been at their strongest to stop anyone getting in from the causeway. A precaution, just in case Guthrum and his Vikings managed to find this island hidden away in the Somerset marshes. We came here looking for King Alfred. We didn't find him over at the Abbey, but what we did find was much more important, evidence right here of why he's known as the Great. Because when he was on the run from the Danes, he didn't just wander around in the marshes. He came here to the Island of Princes, a defensive site he already knew and which had been in existence for over a thousand years in order to regroup, make weapons and plot the downfall of the invaders. It's nice to know that even after 100 programmes, Time Team can still come up with the unexpected. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.